Is laziness the key to cracking the AP Chem exam? Well, you might have thought this was just clickbait, and I was going to say, absolutely not. If you want to do well on the test, you've got to be prepared to use some serious brute force, memorize every definition, table and chart in the textbook, work endless practice problems, give up hours of sleep every night, and cry blood. But actually, this approach isn't very successful. So, what is key? Well, it's not exactly laziness, but maybe the term is more like work smarter, not harder. Students who tend to do really well on the AP Chem exam, they, they don't memorize everything. Instead, they work to understand the concepts and see the big picture. This lets them see which details are important and which aren't. And because of that deep understanding, they can often see shortcuts and find easier ways of solving problems. And there's also an element of what we might just call cleverness. You can see a big difference when students run into a type of problem they haven't seen before. A student who's used this approach will often say, oh no, I forgot to memorize a problem like that. Or they might blame others and say, my teacher never taught me that. But a student who's used this approach might say something like, yeah, I can figure that out. And I can even see a shortcut so I don't have to do any hard math. For better or for worse, the AP Chemistry exam, particularly the multiple choice questions, tends to reward students who've used this approach and have this type of understanding. And the exam tends to be written in a way that is very, very challenging for students who've taken this approach to learning. Now, this isn't laziness because it still requires hard work and effort, but it's very different from the brute force, memorize everything approach over here that's all about blood, sweat, tears, and exhaustion. So, if you're like many students, you might be thinking, okay, thanks for telling me this, but what does it actually look like to use this better approach of understanding, big picture thinking, shortcuts, and cleverness? It sounds great, but I don't really know what it looks like. Well, that's what we're going to see in the rest of this video. We'll look at examples of this smarter, not harder thinking in action. Sometimes it's easier to learn things first from a different point of view. So we're going to start with two quick non-chemistry examples, and then we'll work through two AP-style chemistry problems to show how we'd approach them if we really understand the concepts at hand and we're trying to use this type of thinking. Okay, let's see what smarter, not harder looks like in action. When I was in high school, I'd be at the mall with my dad, and I'd be in a situation like this. I'd see something that I wanted to buy, let's say it was $79.95, but the store was having a sale, 15% off. Well, I'd want to know how much money I'd be saving. And this was way back then, uh, before everyone had calculators on the cell phones in their pockets. So there's a formula from math class that I'd memorized, okay? Original value times percentage expressed as a decimal. And so I'd imagine the formula, 79.95 times 0 0.15. And then I'd try to do the multiplication, pretending to you know, write it in the palm of my hand or write it in the air, trying to work out the multiplication, trying to do it for about five seconds, and I'd realize it was hopeless. I'd memorized this equation, but I couldn't solve it without a pencil and paper or a calculator. The way my dad would solve this is very different. Because he had a deep understanding, he was a master of smarter, not harder. He'd start by saying, look, 79.95 is basically 80. That makes the math a lot easier. Then 10% of 80 is 8. It's one tenth. You just move the decimal point over. Now, 5% of 80 is half of 10% of 80. 
Okay, so half of 8 is 4. That means 15% of 80 is 8 plus 4 equals $12. So you're saving about $12 and the new price is about $68. Now this would blow me away. And here's what it shows. If you really understand something, you can see the shortcuts and the other opportunities. The memorized formula isn't your only tool. When you really understand something, you realize you might have other options. And of course, you also know when you can use a shortcut and when you can't. If you need to precisely calculate 13.8% of $79.95, you're going to have to use this formula and do some serious math. But real understanding knows, means that you know when you can use each approach. Seeing the big picture is another essential skill. We've talked about that already. The big picture lets you see potential shortcuts and helps you figure out what information might not be important. Again, here's my dad. I remember coming home from school complaining about a test that had a question like this. Which of the following South American countries has the highest population? Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, or Ecuador? I remember saying I was totally lost. The test seemed completely unfair and I should have memorized the populations of all the countries. Well, my dad took one look at the question and he said, just think about a map. Argentina is by far the biggest country. Now, look, maybe it's a trick question and one of these small countries has a huge amount of people in it. But generally, Argentina is going to be your best choice here. And sure enough, if you look up the populations of the South American countries, you'll see Argentina is right up here and the others are down here. I remember saying something like, well, I don't know exactly where those countries are on a map. And of course my dad said, well, that's your first problem. You can't see the big picture. I hope this shows how seeing the big picture can be incredibly helpful and lets you move away from worrying about all of the tiny details, sometimes. Sometimes you do have to have stuff memorized though, and that's important to keep in mind. Big picture understanding doesn't mean that you don't memorize anything. It means you memorize things that help you see, well, the big picture. You memorize stuff that actually helps you solve problems. Now, as we said, the AP Chemistry exam, for better or for worse, tends to encourage and reward this kind of smarter, not harder thinking. So, now that we've looked at the basics of it, let's take a look at how we'd use this type of thinking to tackle some AP style chemistry problems. Our first example, how many liters of O2 gas at STP contain the same number of oxygen atoms as 8.00 grams of SO3 gas, and we're even given the molar mass of SO3. Many students will start trying to solve this problem by writing down a set of conversion factors like this, because they've memorized that you can go from grams to moles to liters and cancel out units like this. But then, they'll realize they have to work in the number of oxygen atoms and they'll have conversion factors like this and they don't know which to use and how to put them in here. The problem is many students haven't seen a question like this before. Uh, they don't know how to address it and this shows why memorizing usually isn't a great strategy. Students often use conversion factors like this but they don't understand why they're doing these steps. They don't understand what these conversion factors actually mean so they can't use this information in other ways to find shortcuts and to build different paths. It turns out this is actually a pretty simple problem if you can think it through from a big picture view. We don't even need to use conversion factors. You could, but that's probably not the best approach here. There are five steps. We'll look at them one by one. First, we go from grams of SO3 to moles of SO3. We do that by dividing the grams by the molar mass. We're essentially dividing 8 
by 80 here. So with significant figures, we've only got to worry about three. We just get 0 0.1 moles of SO3. Okay, now, how many atoms of oxygen is that? Well, there are three oxygen atoms in each SO3 molecule. So we multiply this by three. 0.1 moles of SO3 times three gives us 0.3 moles of oxygen atoms. Okay, now how many moles of O2 molecules would have that number of oxygen atoms? Well, each molecule of O2 has two oxygen atoms. So we need to take this number and divide by two. 0 0.15 moles of O2 would have 0 0.3 moles of oxygen atoms. Okay, so we have this number of moles of O2. And finally, how many liters would that number of moles take up at STP? We can take this and multiply it by 22.4, which is the number of liters that one mole of gas takes up at STP. You can use a calculator for this and you'd get 3.36 liters. But you don't even need to use a calculator here. We're multiplying 22.4 by 0 0.15. 0 0.1 mole would take up one tenth of this amount, which is 2.24. Just move the decimal point over one space. And then 0 0.05 moles is just half of this, which is 1.12. Add these together and you get 3.36. Choice C. So as you can see, if you can think through the problem and see the big picture, you can do it in about 30 seconds, maybe even less. We don't need to use conversion factors, but we have to be able to explain what we're doing at each step and know why we're doing it. And as you can see from the stuff in red, there are some things that you do need to memorize, but you need to understand again why you'd be using them and how you'd be using them. If you really want to succeed on the AP Chem exam, this is the type of thinking that you need to master. Here's our second chemistry question. The equation for the ionization of formic acid is given below. Which of the following represents the most likely equilibrium concentrations for the species involved. Now honestly, when many students see this type of question, they just freeze up. They don't even know where to begin. There's a certain type of calculation associated with acid and equilibrium. And when students see these terms, many will start trying to set up these steps they've memorized and they'll try to see how they can squeeze this problem into this format or use some of these pieces to try to solve the problem. But if you understand the underlying concepts, you can take a step back and see that it's actually a really straightforward and you might not even have to do any math. There's a shortcut. Let's start at the beginning. First off, formic acid is a weak acid. We can see that it's an equilibrium here, which is a good clue that it's a weak acid. But also, it's not on our list of strong acids. As we said before, sometimes you do have to memorize stuff, and this list of strong acids is a really good thing to have memorized. But again, you want to make sure that when you're memorizing things, you understand when to use them, how to use them, how they will be helpful. So it's important that formic acid is a weak acid because weak acids only partially ionize. Most of the acid remains unionized. In other words, at equilibrium, lots of this acid remains and not much of these, the hydronium and the formate ion, have been made. We can express the balance between the concentration of this and the concentrations of these by using the Ka. For a weak acid, the Ka is very small. And that's because your unionized acid is in the denominator and you have a lot of this remaining at equilibrium, so it's a large number. And you don't have much of these, 
So you've got these small numbers in the numerator. Divide some small numbers by a large number and you get a really small number. How small? Usually significantly less than one. Weak acids tend to have Ka's on the order of uh, 10 to the negative fifth, 10 to the negative fourth, 10 to the negative tenth. No, it doesn't make sense for you to memorize this list, but you should know that Ka's for weak acids are small, really small. Putting together everything we said, we know that uh, these numbers should be small and this should be large. And if you look at the answer choices, there's only one that fits. Here, large value for this, two small values for this. You don't even have to do the math. D is the only possible choice. Now, if you're a very careful person like me, you might be a little bit worried about choice C. It's not big and small, but the numbers are pretty close in value. Is that maybe a good choice too? Well, the thing is, if you set up the expression, do the math, plug in the numbers, you'll see it comes out to one. That would be super, super, super big for the Ka of a weak acid. Remember that weak acid Ka's are usually like 10 to the negative fourth, 10 to the negative fifth, and even smaller. We're asked for the most likely concentrations here. So a Ka of one would not be a good choice for a weak acid. Thus, we can be very confident with choice D. Again, we didn't even have to do the math. So, I hope you've gotten a good introduction to the sort of big picture thinking. And you can start seeing how you might be able to use it on the AP Chem exam. Also remember, it's not laziness. You still got to work hard to learn the concepts, but the idea is to understand them well enough that you can see shortcuts when they're available. If this video was helpful, I have a whole bunch of free resources for the AP Chemistry exam. You can download those at the link in the video description below. Best of luck in AP Chem.